So hello guys, I hope you're all well and having a lovely week. Tonight, Middlesex University Product Design, Product Design Engineering and Design Engineering are excited to host the 19th Talking the Annual Guest Lecture Series. So this series runs weekly throughout the academic year on Thursday evenings, bringing together a vibrant mix of speakers from across the full spectrum of design and engineering. We have a mix of leading practitioners, opinion leaders and radical thinkers and emerging talents to inspire and support your professional development. Tonight, we're excited to host Gareth Henry, Simulation con Consultant at Royal Haskening in the DHV. So who's uh, Gareth? I'm sure Gareth will tell you a little bit more about himself in the coming moments, but a short summary for those who might have missed some of the circulations. Gareth graduated with an MEng in Robotics and Cybertronics from Heriot Watt University in 2012. Um, Gareth has since worked for LANA, um, now the Royal Haskening DHV, for two years, and he had previous experience as well in system integration for automotive industry. Um, alongside the virtual uh, commissioning production lines as well, uh, as well as discrete uh, event simulation. Gareth is the father of twins, a boy and a girl. He also enjoys playing football and golf in his spare time. And we obviously look forward to hearing more about Gareth's journey in the coming moments. Guys, as usual, feel free to gather your thoughts, your questions, your comments in the chat throughout the talk. We're going to have some Q&A at the end as well. And there's also the option to go live and interact with Gareth after the main talks. And over to Gareth with a talk title, What is Discrete? event simulation and where can it be used? All yours, Gareth. No problem, so I'll just share my screen just so everyone lets me know, if everyone can let me know they, they're seeing that. That's perfect. That's great, lovely. So if I do look over to my, my left slightly, it's because it's I've got the slides on, on that side. So, um, so no, uh, welcome everyone and, and thank you everyone for actually attending uh, today's uh, talk. Uh, I know it's uh, late on in the evening for you all, and, and you've, you've probably all had had quite a long day, so you, you want to get away quite quickly. But as Ahmed said, I'm going to be here after the talk as well. You can always reach out uh, to me via LinkedIn or email as well. So today's talk, I'll be talking about my uh, my progress, my uh, experiences for the last 10 years within the simulation world. Uh, talking a little bit more about my role at the moment with uh, Lana Royal Haskonian DHV um, and what what my role entails and some projects I've been working on in the last couple of years. So as Ahmed said, uh, I'm Gareth Henry. I'm a simulation consultant as part of the customer success team within the twin brand within Royal Haskonian DHV. And I'll be explaining a bit more about what that is as we go through. So I've split today's presentation into to four parts. So we'll do an introduction into myself, giving a bit of context uh, about who I am uh, and who I work for. So Royal Haskoning DHV or RHDHV for short. Uh, it's a large company, it spans the whole world. We've got offices in Holland where they're based as headquarters, the UK, South Africa, America, Australia, New Zealand, and Brazil. So we have a wide reaching uh, company. So I'll be describing where I sit and also the work we do. And then we're gonna be spending a bit of time discussing discrete event simulation, digital twins, and where that sits and how we, we use that to, to better lives around the world. And then I'll give you a quick overview of three projects I've worked in, one being in the um, energy sector, one being in the automotive sector, and one also then in the food and beverage sector. So spreading across multiple different fields using the same platform, the same software. And then finally, we'll have a, a quick roundup of the presentation. Hopefully uh, you guys will engage with some questions. If you don't, don't hesitate. Uh, that's fine. I'd have probably been too shy as well during guest lectures to, to have asked questions. But if you ever want to reach out and uh, drop me an email or a message on LinkedIn, then you're more than welcome to do that. So who am I? So as we said, I'm Gareth Henry. I'm a father of twins, one boy, one girl. Uh, they are 16 months old now, so uh, I've definitely got my hands full in that, that regard. Uh, I graduated uh, from Heriot-Watt University uh, with a Master's of, of Engineering in Robotics and Cybertronics in 2012. So I've been in, in industry now since December 2012, where I got my first job 
as a SCADA uh, operator for a uh, research and development project, and then moved into more engineering based SCADA builds for six months before I then moved into a company called the Automotive Technology Group, who was later acquired by Wood, who then uh, did virtual commissioning for mainly Jaguar Land Rover. And one of my, my claims to fame is that every single Jaguar Land Rover that has come off the production line in Solihull, their Slovakian plant and Halewood in, in Liverpool, in the last nine years, I have virtually commissioned that production line. So I have tested that that production line has worked correctly before it's been allowed to go to site. So that's, that's a different side of simulation. That's not discrete event, that's, that's virtual commissioning. And we can discuss those afterwards if you're interested in that area as well uh, with some questions. Uh, and as I had said, I'm, I'm a keen golfer and footballer. Unfortunately, I don't get much time to do that at the moment with, with the twins. Uh, so yeah, we, uh, we, I, I do that when I can. So luckily with the, the summer coming up, I'll be able to get out and play a bit more football uh, and take the kids golfing maybe with me. And then we'll start looking into why I've chosen consulting and why I'm in the role that I am today. So who are Royal Asconing or RHDHV? So they are a Dutch engineering consultancy company. Uh, the company, the company's reputation is, is so strong within Holland that they were knighted, hence the Royal part of the name Royal Haskoning. And so they have a very strong reputation within, within Holland and the wider world as well for construction and engineering consultancy. So new ports in Holland, uh, RHDHV, are heavily involved in the design and the the implementation and, and build of those ports. But RHDHV is, is much bigger than, than just the Netherlands and the simulation. Uh, I'm just one or my company is just one small part. Our office is based in, in London, uh, is in Birmingham, but we also have several offices around the world. Some One in London that overlooks Westminster. Uh, we have offices, as I said, in uh, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, we have offices in Paris and in Houston, Texas, as well as in uh, Detroit as well, in the United States. It's a massively diverse uh, company and covers um, building uh, installations as well as flood planning as well for future work. So an introduction into Twin. This is a new uh, brand that RHDHV has set up within, um, within their digital business unit software um, department. And they're focusing on software solutions. So included in this is uh, the software package that I work on, which is called Witness, which is a discrete event simulation, but they also have Aqua Suite, Smart Mooring, and Ambiental as their main three, four packages, including Witness. Um, Ambiental is about um, checking out for flood predictions to see if, so if you apply for insurance and they always ask you, is your property liable to flood? They'll run it through an Ambiental software to say yes or no in the next 100 years is your property uh, likely to flood and that's used throughout the world aqua suite is is used for monitoring flow of liquids and is mainly used in utilities within the uk so thames water uses aqua suite to to check on flow of water throughout a pipe in a system and these all fit within the the twin brand uh, as they're all very similar digital software packages to allow you to, to test future scenario cases. But a bit more about the company that I actually am a part of. So originally they were called Lana and they were bought in 2019 by Royal Haskoning. And the name Lana came from a type of Falcon, which is 
uh, been been known to have incredible vision and MIFs have said that they can see into the future. And so that is what our simulation package allows us to do. It allows us to actually run scenarios, run tests to see if and what will happen in the future given certain circumstances and what if scenarios. So we were bought in 2019. Before that, we were one of the, the, the largest independently owned simulation software companies within the UK. And we are competing against companies like Plants uh, Siemens with Plant Simulation, uh, Cooker Robotics with uh, Visual Components, uh, Simulate, and other simulation based packages like that. But, Steam, uh, but Witness has one of the biggest uh, install platforms in the world. Uh, and we, de we develop specific softwares for Japan and Germany, Poland, France, Portuguese as well. So Poland, uh, Portugal as well. So although the, the teams are all separate, we do work closely together with the other members of TWIN uh, to help increase our productivity and also increase the diversity of markets that we can work within as a team. So just looking a little bit at the diverse markets that we are able to work within. So simulation is not just based in industry. We can use it for any one of these um, facility or these areas and these markets within the globe. So we have done work with uh, West Midlands Police uh, in terms of planning road closures for major events to see how pedestrians will move throughout, throughout the city. We've also worked in retail and call centres as well. We have, we have done a vast range of different simulations. So we can model anything from parts queuing within a factory or a plane schedule. So Heathrow Airport uses our software to plan out which terminals and which gates certain planes are gonna to go to and how quickly they can turn those around. So this is just some of the customers that we work with within the industries. So as you can see there, we've got a wide ranging from everything from Edinburgh Airport, Air France, all the way through to the Home Office and the NHS for helping in understanding um, amount of beds needed and turnaround capability of certain wards. So this is just some of the examples of some of the, uh, the capabilities and the value that simulation has been able to add to certain customers. So as you can see there, Coca-Cola, we've increased throughput by 18% and saved them £2 million, which is not a small amount of money to anybody. And increasing throughput by 18% is also quite a big, big achievement there. So let's actually move into what is predictive simulation? Where do we use it and how and why do we use it? So simulation is creating a representation of a real system. It creates a digital twin to be precise. So the name we'll use is, is digital twin. Uh, the digital twin is then used to ask and answer questions about the effect of changing that real system. So you can then start looking into the future. What, what happens if this buffer or this system fails? Where do my, my stock levels? Um, come into effect? How can I improve my throughput? How can I optimize what I'm doing? So what is digital twin? So as I've said before, digital twin is, is simulation packages about creating real world representations in a digital format 
So we're putting in real assets, real cycle times, real um, simulation assets together and helping to understand what's going on in the real world. It could be a, a pie in the sky uh, scenario. So you've got a brand new facility. You don't know if that facility will work. So instead of spending all that money to begin with, you can put that into a simulation and that'll be able to give you the answers of, of yes or no to a very high degree of uh, exact, um, high degree of consistency and sort of understanding of whether or not it's going to work. So there are some principles to simulation. And so the first principles of simulation is why, do we, why and when would we use simulation? So discrete event simulation is best when the model has massive amounts of variability, huge uncertainty, and also quite a lot of con connectedness and complexity in there. So if it's a very complex system, like some of the models I will show, then simulation is always best. If you're planning 10, 15, 20 years into the future, that's always best. One of the great examples I've got is when I was working in with the automotive um, companies, Jaguar Land Rover, or one of them, in their paint shop, they were designing how to improve their paint shop. And they had a big layout of their paint shop on a CAD model printed out that filled a, a, a boardroom table. They had little models of their car and a stopwatch and they would place it on each position and they would start and stop the stopwatch as they moved it through the system. And that's how they try to optimize their production line. So as you can see, that that's, it's very good if it's a simple scenario, just a linear throughput. But the moment you start putting failures, breakdowns in, or you want to check what happens 10 years into the future, that method falls apart very quickly. And that is where simulation comes in. It allows you that to predict what could happen, the impossibles. So your simulation doesn't have to include all of these, but just one of these is where simulation will be beneficial to help you. So the benefits of predictive simulation and discrete event simulation. So the benefits are, it allows you to size the business correctly. So size your factory, size the investment that you put into that, that facility. It reduces the risk. So if you have a risk, it reduces that right down. You don't have to spend as much money as building a facility or making changes to actually understand if the answer is going to work or not. And another example I've got is when I was working for uh, another company where they we went to site. It was an existing facility, and they they said, "Oh, this is where it's the failure is. This is where we need to speed up." They were prepared to spend nearly two million pounds on speeding up this one area. We did a simulation and we discovered that a quick sensor, quick change to the logic in terms of how the stuff was working, helped speed up their throughput by nearly a factor of 45% greater than if they'd spent that £2 million. So they were able to save that money, run their tests even whilst they were doing their production line, and that helped save them and speed up the actual implementation of their improvements. So it helps develop robust cases for investment. Like I just said in that example, they were prepared to spend two million pounds and the simulation was allowing them to see, actually, we don't need to spend that much. We can scale back on our, our expenditure, save a bit of money and increase our throughput. So it's designed to fit the purpose of the process. So it's designed to actually help understand the exact process that we have. It discovers how best to leverage the technology. So if you don't, if you put rubbish in, you'll get rubbish out of the simulation. It's only as good as the data that you put into it. It maximizes the effectiveness of resources available, because if you had someone 
sat there trying to crunch numbers on an Excel spreadsheet, that would take them a long period of time to do. Within an actual simulation model, it would speed that up much quicker. You, once you've got that model there, you can run different tests, different scenarios, different runs, and be able to run that. It helps validate a new plan for a business model or helps justify your business model that you have. So there are just some typical questions that we see that normally comes out of these, these consultancy phases that we have with, with customers. How can I deliver more with less? So how can I actually, that's the big question at the moment, we're trying to automate, reduce overheads, reduce costs to increase efficiency. How can I do more with what with less? What impact will these changes have on my deliveries, my costs, what I can supply and what I do need supplied to me? What investment should I prioritize? So where is my biggest bang for my buck, as they say? Where, where can I get the most input for the least amount of money spent? Is this new factory justified? Is this new project, this new process that we're planning, is it justified? Is it actually going to achieve what we want it to achieve? Will introducing a new machine really help or will it just increase a problem further down the line? And that's where simulation can help. You can change the, the layout of your facility, change the structure of your process. What is the right level of inventory as well? As factories are starting to become more uh, just-in-time operations and businesses are just becoming just-in-time as well, you don't want to be holding on to too much stock because that increases your footprint, your size of your, your warehouse, your facility, which then increases your costs. And everything at the moment is about helping reduce costs, help reduce uh, impact on climate, and help also future carbon capture and stuff like that as well. I think this change will work, but I need to persuade my investors. I need to show them that this change will work. They are, that's another one that we get quite often. So they've got an idea, but they, they don't know how to prove that that idea will work. And that's where simulation is a big uh, factor in that. And the final one is, I know there's a big change that needs to happen. How do I reduce the risk? So again, reducing risk, helping reduce the level of complexity that they need to attack in the real world. So there are just some, some methodologies that we use when, when we are consulting, and this can work with any project that you work on. So I was using this actually, these, this type of methodology whilst I was at university as well for my, my dissertation, understanding what I needed to do for, for group projects. So there's multiple phases to be done within, within a project. Before we can start any project, we need to actually understand the what, the requirements, what is actually needed for this project to succeed? What is the outcome? What is the questions that they're trying to answer? And once we know that, then we can start looking at a scoping phase, as we call it. So we can actually go in, look at every detail, get all the information we need before we start building our model. So we know how we're going to build our model before we start building our model. And this is called scoping. And this, is, this can highlight big problems early on in, in, the, in the process. So if you don't know of a certain information, it also helps the customer understand the limitations and what to expect from the model that we're building. And then we look at building the model. We're in the create phase where we actually build our model. We, we design it, we build it. We start doing a bit of testing to understand, making sure that the model is working as we're expecting it to. And we're getting good, confident data against the baseline. And then we move into the testing, the verification and validation. This is crucial 
because this gives the customer or the end user the confidence that their model is working as they expect it to. The data is correct. Pardon me. The data is correct. All the information they've got is, is accurate and they can trust going forwards the detail that this model is producing. And then we move into the evaluate, experimentation, different scenarios, different testing, the what if questions that we, we looked at before, answering those business questions, answering those requirements that we had before. And then moving into the payback. So actually implementing what we've discovered in the real, in the simulations back into the real world and actually then validating that that model was accurate to the real world, giving us that baseline comparison. So when we move back into the simulation again for the next phase of testing validation, it's not just one idea, finish what we're doing. These models can run for years and years. And I'll show you that with a couple of the examples that we've got here today where they are constantly evaluating new scenarios, new ideas on their models, and they're able to go back to the simulations year after year to actually give them their ideas and to help improve their methodology and their thinking. And business doesn't stay still, business priorities change. So you may finish your model, finish, realize the value, the, the value of that simulation with the implementations you've put in, but then the customer may come and go, oh, actually, I need some new ideas. I've got some new scenarios to run. So that's where simulation is very powerful. It allows you to go further on, year on year. So we'll move into some of the projects that I've looked at over the last uh, two years with Lana. And then I'll do a brief sort of overview and we'll look at a, uh, a brewery app, which everyone can get access to. I'll send Ahmed uh, the link to it later on after this session. And you can all have a go at, at running different scenarios and try and be, be up that leaderboard that we've got built in. So different, different testing and different scenarios. So the simulation projects that I've worked on, I'll touch one, which is automotive. One in the energy sector, so liquid natural gas, so LNG for short, which is a big topic at the moment uh, with the energy crisis that we're dealing with. And then one in food and beverage all using the witness package, all tackling different ideas, different sort of customer requests, and also looking over different spans of time as well. So the automotive one. So this was for a company in America where they were a new facility where they were supplying headliners and doors to VW in America in their Chattanooga plant. As it, as it is. Uh, and so they had deliveries of headliners and headliners are the roof section with all the wiring in. If you've got a, uh, a suit, sunroof or lighting in there or anything like that, that's what the headliner is called or door panels. So the inside of the door with the windows and everything else all hooked up, ready to be sent to site to be actually worked. And what they needed to understand was what was their stock levels that they needed, how many deliveries a week they needed, and how quickly they needed to operate their production line to be able to meet VW's supply requirements, as the automotive industry is one of the biggest just-in-time systems in the world. So everything arrives just as it's needed to go onto the car, so it reduces their production uh, lag and also reduces the size of their facilities. So the approach to this, this simulation was we did, as I said, the scoping study where we understood all of the requirements. And then we built this. So each of these lines here is actually a forklift truck. We used conveyors because you can use conveyors the same as forklift trucks. It's a different methodology of, of building your models but it's, a, it's a, a simpler way of getting the same answer as out uh, to use for uh, conveyor systems instead of forklift trucks. And so that was our approach was, how could we turn this model around as quick as possible 
to give the information that they required. And the information that they needed was, yes, you could achieve X number of units out per hour in the right order for production, or no, you can't. And the actual outcome was, that was shown was that their actual internal delivery into their factory was not enough. So their suppliers were not able to supply them with enough uh, items to produce 60 units per hour. So they were doing 60 headliners and 60 doors separately an hour. And if we have time and people are, are interested in, I will be able to load these models up uh, and share some sort of more in-depth uh, analysis at the, the end of this talk, if that is something that people are, are interested in. So this one ran over a week to, uh, to work out the, the production schedule, to work out how many they needed to be delivered at each interval. And you could work out what truck needed to be arriving at any given point to give the supplier an actual schedule for arrival, for truck arrivals of product. But you can run this scenario for, for 20 years if you wanted to work out exactly a forecast of how many products you needed and what happens if something broke down and you needed to replace it. How long would your stock last within your facility? The next one is the energy. So this is LNG. This is for Katagas. And they are, one of, they are the biggest... LNG exporter in the world. So liquid natural gas is, is measured in million tons. Currently, Katagas exports 77 million tons of liquid natural gas every year, which works out to be about 700 ships, cargo transports every year to around the world. They're proposing over the next five years to almost triple that production of liquid natural gas. And so they're using our simulation to run a 10 year scenario of their ramp up. So their production, how much they can produce in a year, how much storage they need to hold that production, how many ships they need in their fleet because they own their own ships and what customers can they supply? How much can they supply to each customer and to work out their commercial contracts that they need to be able to supply all of that? And so we are, we are in a, a nine year relationship with Katagas now, and they are actually starting to use this for planning their, their ship delivery schedules to customers as well. So this model will run for 10 years, ramping up the amount of production they do, increasing, decreasing the number of ships, changing the contracts per year, allowing you to run different scenarios and different tests for maintenance, sizes of ships, as well as also sort of increasing your production. So that's the outcome of this is if we're able to save them two ships, that's nearly $150 million that they've saved just by saving on two ships. So that is a, that's a huge savings for, for a company. And it also reduces their carbon emissions as well with the ships being used. And the next step that we are, we are currently still working with Katagas, it's a project I'm still heavily involved in, is actually what's the next stages how how much can they go they're trying to remove some of their older sort of diesel generated vehicle ships importing some new ships bigger ships exploring new markets so they may need to start changing ships over installing more uh, technology offshore as well to transfer product from bigger ships to smaller ships to allow them to go to to, to smaller countries to export their, their, their liquid natural gas, their LNG. And that is something we're now looking at with them as well. The best business case for them going forwards and how much they can produce in a year and how much they can actually sell in a year.
And the final one is the most recent project I've been working on. This is for a food and beverage company and is looking at actual water and changeover of a soft drink. So this is for one of the biggest soft, soft drink manufacturers in the world. Um, it's PepsiCo, so they work with Gatorade that this, is, this line is for. And they have two different products running through their line. So they have one product in product feed one that you can see here. It runs through the system all the way through to where they bottle it. And Gatorade needs to be actually fermented and heated and cooked before it's bottled. So when they change over their product line, they have to flush it with hot water to remove all of the residue of the previous product and clean and sterilize the entire system before they can move the next system in. So what we're looking at for this simulation is actually how can they reduce their water usage and also increase their productivity, so reduce their changeover time. At the moment, their changeover time is nearly 25 minutes. And this is in every single production line that they have. They're looking at reducing that down to nearly nine minutes. And the simulation is showing them how and the sequence of operations that they need to do to be able to get that down, to remove that product out of the system. So which valve do we open? Which pumps do we run? How much should we have in each tank? How do we, we get through the, the system quicker? Obviously, that relies on, on them providing us the size of the tanks, all of that lot. And the outcome at the moment is that we have made, made the, the changeover. They've taken this new process to site. They've run some scenario testing and they've actually got it to nine, nine and a half, 10 minutes on a, on a perfect run, on a slow run where they've got slightly more product in the system it's still coming out at 15 minutes. So they're saving 10 minutes of, of waste time there. And they've reduced their water usage as well, which in, in the current climate is, is a great win for them. It means they're saving more water. They're not, not wasting as much. And the next steps of this production line or this simulation is to roll it out to the next 162 sites they have in America for Gatorade, uh, Pepsi, Pepsi Max, Pepsi, all of those products throughout and then start looking at their other business units they have as well. So Walkers, Lays, those as well for their product changeover to help reduce waste. That's what this, this is about. So it's about bettering the world of tomorrow with simulation to help reduce waste and help reduce carbon emissions as well. And that is the new area in which simulation is going towards. So that's, they're the products and the projects that I've recently worked on. Uh, just sort of why you may want to look at simulation consultant or uh, consultancy and simulation in, in general. You're not just working on one project. So I'm working on four different projects at the moment. I'm training people as well. I'm giving uh, guest lectures. So it's a wide varying range of, of different areas. As you can see, just by three examples I've worked on. And in my previous job, I wasn't a simulation consultant. I was a simulation engineer. Same job, just different title. Uh, I was customer facing. So if you are a people person, you want to to communicate with, with people, you like sort of exploring challenges and understanding what's going on, then the, the simulation world consultancy is, is a great world to be in. It's applying real world, it's not just theoretical, you're actually helping improve the lives of people around the world. So we are, we're also currently looking at Welsh Water, where we're working with them, and Thames Water about how they can improve their um, management of their, their waste treatment uh, production facilities. So how much chemicals they put in, how they can actually reduce the amount of chemicals they, they use. Again, helping 
the environment, helping the, the people of London yourselves drink better, healthier water. And so that's something that we are also looking at and working with. That's a very early phase at the moment. So I unfortunately don't have any anything to show for that. That's still in scoping at the moment. But you also, if you're a problem solver, you like solving problems, then simulation is, is, a, is a great area to work at and look at. It's one of those, those areas where every day is different. The every day presents a new challenge. And that's something that I, I thoroughly enjoy and I, I'm really excited about being involved in. So to, con to conclude, and then I'll show you the, the brewery app, and then we're, we're open for some questions afterwards as well. So in conclusion, so simulation, digital twin, they're very powerful tools to allow you to actually use them to solve problems, to find solutions to, to difficult questions or help a business grow, help a business develop. So they are, it's broad ranging. It covers a multitude of different scenarios, different applications. As I've said, we've done PC repair shops. We've done chip manufacturing. We've done police work with analysis, airports, food and beverage, pharmaceuticals, liquid natural gas. The actual we're doing currently, we're doing offshore wind farms. How do you build them in the North Sea with wind calculations and how that works as well? So we've got, it's a wide ranging tool that isn't just limited to, to one field. It, it can touch anything that has a process. Simulation can be used to, to test scenarios and demonstrations and understanding and help make the world a better place for tomorrow help save water, help with carbon capture, going to net zero going forward. That is one of our big goals at RHDHV, is to enrich the lives of 1 million people by 2025. And so that is one of our big, big goals within RHDHV in all of our areas. And simulation is leading the way and able to do that. So just want to show you the demo model. This was created by uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Sam Dean. And this is a brewery app, so you can make scenario changes. So if I just click on this link, I'll bring it up. It allows you to, to sign up. You can put your name in, email address, put that in, create my account. Oh, I've read, create my account. Okay, well, we got one. So if you create an account, you then get a scenario. So you are a microbrewery. You're wanting to use simulation to improve your productivity. So you can look at your current scenario. So this is the layout. You've got your results here. And as I said, I'll send this link out to Ahmed. You can circulate it around. And you can click on boiling. You've got so much money that you can spend so you've got sixty thousand pounds to spend and you can choose where you want to spend that money and then you can run your scenario give it a new name so call it a test submit the scenario it runs the simulation in the background as you can see, it's queuing. It's still, it's running the test. So this will fire up uh, a product we have, which is Witness IO, which uses cloud computing to run the scenario. And once that's finished, you'll be able to see how much you've saved and what your CO2 per bottle is. So as you can see there, I'm my CO2 per bottle is 619 grams. I'm generating 62,000 pounds from that scenario. And you can play different scenario results. You can look at different op options, opportunities, different sort of energy usage, amount of water you've used per bottle. 
And so that is just an example of, of what the simulation can do and how you can, you can play around with it and explore different scenarios within simulation. And I'll, I'll encourage you all to, to have a go and have a think about what you can be doing with this. So this is using witness in the background. And this also links then to our about Lana, who we are and what we do as well, if you're more intrigued in, in understanding what, what we do and how we go about our work. So I'll open it up now. We're about two minutes early to, for the questions and answers, but I'll open it up now for any questions. These are my, my details. Again, I'll send these over to, to Ahmed who can circulate them around. As I've said, if you want to ask me a question, fire away, you can email me, you can contact me on LinkedIn. I'm more than happy to, to meet up with you and, and talk to you privately if that is something that you want to do, if you want to explore simulation further going forwards in the future. Amazing. Uh, Gareth, that was a fascinating talk, uh, touching on your journey across robotics, uh, virtual commissioning and, and discrete event simulation as well. Yeah. Like, uh, I really enjoyed that introduction of uh, Royal Haskening DHV, uh, you, the introduction to predictive simulation and like first principles in terms of like why to simulate with you, the, the three projects and case studies. That was, that was brilliant. Um, as, as usual, guys, uh, feel free to continue to gather your thoughts, questions and comments in the chat. Um, we'll just run through some of those now. Sam so, um, Orvi uh, is asking... Um, a question, could you show us an example of the methodology process in simulation, please, uh, Gareth? Yep, so the methodology within simulation. So if I find one of my products, projects, so the two that I'm commonly working on at the moment is PepsiCo. So we would go through, I don't actually have scoping on that one. Let me find one that has uh, the scoping and, and the methodology that we, we would use. So the methodology would be within sort of our, our sort of strategy that we do. So, let me, so it'd be within our, our consulting methodology. So we would, we would look at the requirements. I'm just going to try and find a scoping document for you all now. Uh, I know where there is one because I was looking at it earlier today. So we would produce a, a scoping document. So this is the scoping document. So we would go through introduction, introduce ourselves to, to, to the company, what the project is. And then we would go through the methodology. So scoping. So we would, we would find all the information out. We would work out what's going on. We would produce this model. So we, we outline the context of the, the project, what we're going to do, what we're going to achieve put in all the information, how we're going to achieve that within our, our study. And then we'd actually then go in to start building our model and how we go about that. Does that, does that answer the question? If, if needs be, we can talk about it a little bit more if, if needs be. I can, I can find some more information that, that you may want later on and, and email that across if necessary. Amazing. A question coming through in the chat, uh, Gareth, um, if you could uh, show us a live demonstration of a simulation. Yep, I'll show you the, the PepsiCo model. Uh, that's the one that I know is the most the most sturdy because it's the one I've been looking at today. I'm still still working with them to justify some of the results that we've had and, and some of the works we've got. So this is the Witness software. This is the Witness platform. And so this is this is the production line we've got going on here. So if I start that, you can see that we've got water running through, or not water, but this is Gatorade. So in, in the, the actual real world, this is cool blast, they call it. And then they move it over to orange summer or something, something like that. The, the names that they've got, they, they do have some, some good names. So this will run for an hour. I can speed it up so it doesn't run real time. We can run it as, as quick as we want. We can run it without animation as well, if necessary. So this will run for an hour just to give some standard uh, operation of, of normal working time for the simulation just to build up the levels in all the tanks that we need. So it's all a, a standard operating process. This is their current process that they have. So it takes about 25 minutes to, to do the full changeover. 
Amazing. And so, yeah, when we get to the minute, we'll, we'll see the product will stop. So the yellow product will stop. Water will then be flushed through the system. Then the green product will come in and, and move around. So you can ask more questions while this is running if you want, or you can all just sit and watch. So as you can see, it's now starting the changeover process. And I'll slow it down just to show what's, what's going on a little better. So this is one where it's helping them save on water and producing what they need to do. That's brilliant. I think it links uh, really nicely to another question there, Gareth. Um, Omieti Manuel's asking um, in terms of how long does it take to make these predict uh, predictive simulations? Um, and uh, for example, uh, how long do you, uh, you see each one of these simulations lasting? So it depends on the complexity of the model. So the uh, Catagas model that I showed the video or the, the picture of, that one is a, a constant ongoing development. So we've been working on that one for nine years now, and we're still working on it. And we have a, a, uh, a contract with them for at least the next six years to be developing and improving that model uh, because of the amount of complexity they have in there. The, this PepsiCo model took us about two weeks to build um, because of the complexity again in here. But then the automotive one I showed took me three days to build. So it ranges completely depending on the complexity, the questions you're trying to answer, how you actually run it. So how we run these models, and I'll show you that now, is we have an Excel model manager. Again, we're moving towards more app-based. So this will not be Excel, this will be an app. But you can then, when this loads, the big Excel files, that's the problem. Because this is where we retrieve all our data, show all our information as well so yeah it, it depends on 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 the, the size of the model and for the length of use depending on what the customer is requiring out of it this model will be used for the next at least two years they've they've guaranteed that for different scenario tests different runs changing out sizes of tanks and, and stuff like that for optimizing their production line the Catagas one will be running for as long as I believe the company will be will be around for. They are they value that that software that much that they use it every day to test different scenarios, different fleet structures, different tank sizes to to best optimize their their systems. And they're not just looking next week, next month. They're looking 10, 15, 20 years into the future. So we're doing simulations for car gas now for 2042. Amazing. So that's how far they're thinking into the future. That's amazing. Um, yes, it's superb. And I think another question from Omieti Emmanuel, um, linking to the kind of a brewery simulation. Yep. Um, how, how long would it take to make a predictive simulation software then? To make the software, mm -hmm. uh, we have a, a team of 25 developers working on Witness. I know that my previous job I was working, I worked more closely with Siemens and their development team and their software plant simulation, they took 25 years to actually develop their software to, to do this. Uh, Witness has been around since 1986 and mm -hmm. it's still improving, still developing, still, still changing to this day. We're still adding new features. So it's not a, a short period of time to to build a model or a, a predictive simulation package that goes into the same depth and detail that the witness or plant sim or any of the others go into. Amazing. A question coming in from Orvi. Um, how can simulation be used in the design and development of products? So within the design and development of products. So again, uh, you can use Different simulations, you may not be needing discrete event simulations, but you, you can use um, flow analysis simulations, so um, fluid dynamic simulations. There are around, I, I know I did those uh, at university myself for car automotive, so to make the most streamlined, there are uh, earthquake simulators as well out there that you can 
if you're building buildings, they would run them through an earthquake simulator to make sure they're structurally sound. FEA analysis is, is also a simulation package. Um, so SolidWorks, um, Solid Edge all have FEA analysis built into them. They are all classed as, as simulation packages. So it depends on what, what you're wanting to learn about, what you're wanting to actually find answers for. But yeah, simulation has a part to play in, in, in everyone's future going forwards. Amazing. And another question coming in from Javier, uh, which maps or graphics or visuals do you think are most useful to use in a particular project or a, a simulation? So depending again on, it, it all depends on the answers that you're wanting to find out. So I know um, Ambiental uses actual topographical maps because they're looking at flood risks. So they need the actual, they use Google Maps, they use um, actual alternate survey maps to work out the lay of the land, sort of where water will flow if it's put into this area. And so they use those types of maps. We mainly use CAD drawings. So solid, solid edge, solid works, CAD drawings or AutoCAD or Autodesk mm -hmm. to outline our factory facility because we've always found if you can overlay your simulation over the top of the factory, it allows people to visualize better what's going on. You can show it to then a board of directors who has walked around your factory maybe, but can't visualize, don't know it as well as you do. Then we, we use those types of, of graphs and, and sort of background data. Amazing. And another question from Javier. Um, can the website, so for example, I think the website he was referring to was the one that you showed right at the end. Um, yeah. Simulation for the brewery. Um, can it be used for sustainability simulations as well? That is something we are we are moving towards, and yes, it can be be used for sustainability sort of simulations. We are looking the way where we're going now is we're looking at carbon capture, uh, sustainability within businesses, sort of how a, a a business can can survive turbulent times of um, production short shortages, labor shortages, and stuff like that as well. So that's something that we are looking at. We're looking and working with a couple of companies in Ireland at the moment, medical uh, manufacturing companies, where they are looking at how many members of staff they, they actually need and how they can, they can move forwards into the future to be more sustainable with their waste product and recycle their waste product a little better. Amazing. And another question um, related to uh, the dynamic nature of these simulations. So yeah. are, there any, are, are there any simulations that you've built or worked on or know of um, that captured the real time data from, you know, um, factories or processes and, and kind of feed that into your simulations? I have not. Uh, well, I've worked on in terms of virtual commissioning. That's how virtual commissionings work. They use real world uh, data from the production line in terms of the PLC, the control logics. And then you would then, they work in real time. So you would run it, you would stop a, a simulation, you'd push an emergency stop, you'll fail to load the correct quit, uh, part in, and the simulation would then stop and relay that data back to you. And you would then have to fault find and fix. We are currently working with Washington Water uh, Protection Services over in America. So they're looking at, denuclearizing um, nuclear waste and protecting their river systems within Washington state. And we are currently using what we call a, a tracer bullet program. So it's a full digital twin. So it's using Ambiental, AquaSuite, uh, Witness for their denuclearization of, of water that comes in. So it's like a sewage plant, but contaminated water comes in. They're using the live data that's in those sites at the moment, feeding it into the simulations, working out what happens in the future if, and what levels they need to get to. Amazing. And, and building on that, um, is there any application of machine learning and stuff? Uh, we are, that the, the tracer bullet that we are using is also using machine learning to, to develop and improve. So next time it comes in, the next level of contaminated water, it can process and understand and actually improve its speed up, its, its decontamination of that water. 
Amazing, amazing. And then where do you see uh, the final question um, for today, Gareth? Uh, where, where do you see the kind of the future of simulation alongside obviously considerations to things that's um, kind of emerging now and happening with uh, artificial intelligence? So artificial intelligence and simulation will sit hand in hand. It will actually allow you to do better scenario testing, better what if case studies. You will not have to be able to, you can just set your, your goals that you want to achieve and the AI will come up with the actual scenarios, the tests to run to best achieve that. So we do have a, a bit of uh, artificial intelligence in, in Witness, in our optimizer. So we have a, a program that, that you give it what you want to achieve. So what is your outcome? What is your, your goal? And it will run the scenarios to best find that goal out for you. So Amazing. that's... That's already being used as, as we go forward. And we are looking to improve to help actually build our softwares as well going forward, to help build our models using artificial intelligence. So it speeds up that process as well. That's amazing. Um, Gareth, I think that was the final question that came through in the chat. So um, at this juncture, obviously, uh, we'd like to obviously thank you for take out, taking out your time and joining us tonight. It was a brilliant talk and a great Q&A session as well. So from all of us at Middlesex University, product design, design engineering, we thank you for your time and for the talk. No problem. I'm, I'm happy to do it. And as I've said, if anyone has any questions, uh, may want to, if somebody may want to come to the office and have a look, I know we're, we're based in Birmingham, so it's a bit of a journey. But if you, you do, not more than, more than happy to reach out and, and ask. And I'll be more than happy to, to show you around, show you some projects we're working on and, and sort of discuss anything in the future as well amazing amazing and and guys uh, to, to all, all the students participants to conclude um gareth's details were sent to your emails ahead of the talk and also gareth shared these at the end as well on the final slide so it includes links to the linkedin the website and um, the email so definitely feel free to browse and connect and gareth's uh, happy to obviously talk to you guys individually as well um please keep an eye out on your emails for the details of the speaker and the links to the talk next week and until then stay well stay safe and thank you guys Yep. Thank you, everyone, for attending.